All right, we're going live. Hello, and welcome to our live YouTube event on considering diversity, equity, and inclusion in preventing drug use and misuse. I'm Rich Lucy, one of the Senior Prevention Program Managers in the Drug Enforcement Administration's Community Outreach and Prevention Support Section. My entire career has been spent at the state and federal government levels, first in my home state of New York, and then at the U.S. Departments of Education, Health and Human Services, and now justice, working on issues related to preventing alcohol and other drug misuse among youth and young adults, particularly college students. I'm so excited to be talking about today's topic. I'm pleased to be one of today's moderators with my co-host. Good afternoon, and I'm Jamila Robinson. I'm also a Senior Prevention Program Manager in DEA's Community Outreach and Prevention Support Section. Prior to joining DEA, I served as the policy analyst at the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. I was also a public health advisor in the Office of Assistant Secretary for Health, as well as SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. During my time at HHS, I also served as Lieutenant Commander as a U.S. Public Health Service. We are pleased you're able to join us for this live panel discussion, which is the first time we're hosting such an event. This year, DEA is marking our 50th anniversary as a federal agency charged with enforcing America's drug laws. And as we continue this important enforcement work and engage local communities to support prevention efforts into the next 50 years, it is important that we do so with cultural humility and cultural competence. Today, we are going to spend some time exploring these issues in support of drug use prevention. And now, Let's meet our panelists. First, Anthony Jackson currently serves as the Director of Prevention in the Division of Substance Abuse Services at the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. In this role, he oversees the continuum of substance use prevention activities for the division, including the prevention portion of the Substance Abuse Prevention Treatment Block Grant and the administration of federal discretionary grants from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the U.S. Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance. Among other activities, Tony's office also supports the drug use prevention activities of Tennessee's substance use prevention coalitions and Tennessee Prevention Network providers. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Marquita Robinson. She's the Executive Director of the Urban Minority Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Outreach Program of Dayton, Ohio. She's worked in the field of prevention and treatment for over 18 years, working with youth, adults, and families, as well as criminal justice reentry populations at the local level and the state level. Dr. Robinson is a trainer of trainer in trauma-informed family engagement and various other evidence-based trainings and assisted with the development of the fundamentals of prevention of opioid abuse and dependence curriculum of Ohio's E-based Academy training site. One of Dr. Robinson's longtime passions is helping to improve the quality of life for minority and underserved populations. Dr. Allison Smith, serves as the Assistant Commissioner for Student Health and Wellness for the Louisiana Board of Regents. In this role, she facilitates the Louisiana Higher Education Coalition, oversees statewide core survey administration, provides professional development training for higher education staff and stakeholders, facilitates campus community partnerships, and renders technical assistance around the issue of substance use prevention in Louisiana's collegiate communities. Dr. Smith also focuses on broader campus safety issues, such as hazing prevention, increasing access to mental health resources, and policy matters related to the implementation of Title IX and power-based violence statutes. From May 2007 to present, Special Agent Shavalo Truesdale has served as the Public Information Officer for the Drug Enforcement Administration's Atlanta Field Division. In his role, he oversees DEA's public affairs responsibilities in the states of Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Shavalo also serves as the Atlanta Field Division's Demand Reduction Coordinator, helping to enhance prevention programs across three state region and across the nation by developing strategic alliances with prevention and treatment organizations. 
community coalitions, federal, state, and local governments in an effort to prevent and reduce drug use and misuse. Chivalo has conducted prevention-related community outreach presentations for DEA since 1998. So we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists. So please click on the watch on YouTube button right below the video feed in order to access and participate in the chat. That is where you will pose your questions for either the entire panel or a specific panelist. We're going to start today's program by asking each of our panelists to provide some opening remarks about today's topic from their perspectives. We will hear first from Dr. Robinson, followed by Dr. Smith, Mr. Jackson, and Special Agent Truesdell. Dr. Robinson, welcome to the discussion. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to be here today. One of the things that I would like to say in reference to this particular topic, when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, is understanding the differences in different cultures and cultural beliefs. Those patterns are global. And so having an understanding of how we can best meet the individuals that we're working with inclusively to all people um, and, re and being more relatable. From a community aspect, because I run an, a, a community organization, one of the things that we have noticed and is of utmost focus in our area is the, the, the level of diversity that has changed. It's getting more and more broader, um, pretty much worldwide. But in our community in particular, you have different subsets and subgroups or social groups that are now, and being able to um, relate, being able to connect, being able to bring those um, particular individuals and cultures and parties into um, the equation to have a level of inclusiveness is vitally important. I'm gonna speak specifically in regards to people of color, being that I run an urban minority organization. And one of the things that we have noticed, especially as far as promotion, campaigning, marketing, the information is not always inclusive across the board for all cultures and all populations. And so a lot of times we're missing the mark. And when I say we're missing the mark is they're not being able to connect with what is being said. This is something that I feel is really, really important. However, we know that discrimination, biases and stigma plays the major roles, not only in service delivery, but also in the quality of service that is provided by individuals. Because a lot of times if our workforce doesn't employ individuals to meet the diverse population. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is those that look like the individuals that they're working with. It makes it a lot more difficult for them to connect. However, it doesn't mean that anyone can't serve all diverse populations. The question is, is how do we make sure that cultural humility and those biases are set aside or eliminated so that the individuals being served can get the full effective quality of services that they need to be successful? And we heal all individuals within our communities as opposed to just certain individuals. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. We appreciate that. And we're now going to go to um, Dr. Smith. Hi, um, thank you all for joining us. One, I am very passionate about substance use prevention across our colleges, all types of colleges. We know there are four year, two year, public, private, HBCU, historically black colleges, university, or in predominantly white institutions, or you may hear them HWI, historically white institutions. One, I am in a, the great state of Louisiana where we have six HBCUs. And I am an alumnus of the only HBCU system in the world, the Southern University uh, system. But part of that inspires my passion to make sure that when we're um, doing prevention programming, that it's relevant to all of our student body populations across our campus types. So for us, when I first learned of the idea of peer, peer, um, peer helpers, peer educators, that's not the way in which it was presented to me at, at Southern University. It was Dr. Muriel Harrison saying, help us do HIV 
uh, substance use prevention, and we're going to give our pizza. It looked like community and taking care of my fellow students. It looked like finding ways that we could all pool our resources together to make sure everybody had whatever they needed. So being sure that even with the programs we choose, being flexible in the approach while still maintaining the fidelity to the goal to make sure that we're meeting everybody where they are, because not all strategies and tactics work for each other, work for every campus, because I think there's a really big piece. I think Anthony may be able to touch on it a little later about there's some medical distrust within African-American communities with the medical community. And we have tons of research on um, Black mother, mater Black maternal health, which in Louisiana is, does not do very well in, those types of things that cause people to be distrustful or untrusting yet for um, different things like health promotion campaigns. How are we targeting and making sure that that information is relevant to them? Um, being sure that our campuses um, understand across campus type, not just for our HBCUs, but for uh, students of color that are on our historically or predominantly white institutions, making sure that when we implement programming, we're not just serving a select subset of the population. And so for me, it's very important to make sure that we take the whole student experience and make sure we adequately serve each of them. And for us in Louisiana, that is to make sure if our goal is to hit 60% um, of our uh, working age adults uh, having credentials by 2030, we need to make sure that we're actively trying to reach every single person and not just handing out cookie cutter programs. Great, and Tony, you're gonna follow up next, please. No, it's perfect. Yeah, uh, you know, you look at that question, the outset that, that Rich, I think you asked, and everyone being here today is a part of how we work to resolve and solve this issue. Uh, Dr. Smith, I appreciate you on that one. I'll, I'll try to follow up on that because you it's a very valid point in terms of the perspectives and how that shapes what actually happens versus what should happen, right? That, that That's the thing that we struggle with. So so what I'll do is start with with kind of saying, you know, in my experience in state government, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure I look super young, but I've been in state government for 12 or so years at this point. Uh, what it's taught me is that um, government can take measured, responsible steps to assist those less fortunate than ourselves, right? And work towards how we can be equitable as possible and just as possible. How do we do that, right? We do that by, uh, Dr. Robinson mentioned cultural humility, cultural confidence. Um, you know, Dr. Smith mentioned, um, hey, it's not cookie cutter plans. So, so the way we do that is we have to have processes in place that at the outset, we consider everyone's different, everyone can be different and it's perfectly fine, perfectly okay. We need to work to understand it ourselves and or ensure those sectors or individuals who have that perspective, you just do not, I'm sorry, um, are at the table, right? Um, you know, in state government, uh, we, we have a mission in our department, so I'm gonna read it real quick and then riff off of that. Our mission is to create collaborative pathways to resiliency, recovery, and independence for Tennesseans living uh, with mental illness and some use disorder, okay? When we read that mission, and, and you know, again, I appreciate Dr. Smith and Dr. Robinson at the outset laying this pathway. It's how do we do these collaborative pathways in a way that, in a way that makes sense. Um, Tony Jackson here at the state in Davidson County and Nashville can have a perspective, right? You know, and even just because I'm black doesn't mean I have the perspective of every single person that looks like me. Okay, um, and what I would say is is. You know, it's it's how do we make sure that we don't think of diversity, equity, inclusion as even cookie cutter definitions in of themselves, right? Um, and it's being fair to to everyone and and making sure that they're at the table. Um, how do you do that? Well, one easy thing is is recognizing that we all have shared values, shared perspectives, but then also guess what? We do not have shared values and perspectives in certain areas. How do we bridge that gap? I think the way we bridge that gap is thinking about the value or the impact that multi-sector uh, involvement can have in our work, recognizing that, that, that you need to ensure that everyone's at the table um, and, and their voice can be heard, their perspective can be heard and, and considered. And there may be times that one side may not understand the perspective of the other side. Doesn't mean anyone's wrong. Um, but but it may be recognizing that 
you know, we, we may have to agree and dis to disagree, but still move forward in a way in which the sides are considered in a way in which they feel uh, like they should be considered. Um, so yeah, I think that that's what I've got. Thank you. Looking forward to today. Thank you very much, Tony. And now we'll move on to Shivalo. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So happy to be a part of this Black History program. Um, thank you for joining us today, Rich and Jamila. We thank you for putting this event together. <clears throat> There's a very delicate balance between um, DEA and what it does with regard to, obviously our mission is supply reduction, and that's a very nuts and bolts part of our job. And so that's, don't let me take uh, that and the importance of that away. It's extremely important that that is the focus of our agency to reduce the supply of drugs that are coming in this, into this country. However, the demand reduction side, su supply reduction is important, but demand reduction, reducing the demand for drugs is extremely, extremely important. And I think uh, we get the most value uh, when people that we go out and see uh, understand that we have an important component of, of engaging in, in community outreach. And uh, we need to continue to chip away at that. And it's an evolution of the agency. And I can sort of report back to when I first became the public information officer, there was an evolution from going from get those cameras out of here on the scene to, to inviting some of the media inside and, and giving them an, some insight on what it is we do. So there's so many populations out there that, that have a misunderstanding and misconception of what DEA does. And so inviting them to the table so that they can have a better understanding is certainly helpful in the way of, of inclusion. Um, I can know, I know that there are a lot of organizations that, we, that I've been working hard specifically, specifically to, to interact with, the faith-based community. You know, we oftentimes, don't really think about uh, faith-based, you know, I know there's church and state issues there, but they're common everyday people and they, they need um, intervention and, and just like everyone else, I've had the opportunity to speak into several faith-based groups during Sunday uh, sermons, Sunday school lessons, what have you. So there's so many different sectors of society that needs to see what DEA does and what we have to offer uh, with regard to uh, you know, reducing the, the demand for drugs. And I think as long as we continue to do that and make ourselves available, then we'll be able to, to uh, show folks that we're just a lot more than about, you know, arresting people. You know, we've all heard the saying of arresting our way out of a problem, out of this issue we have. It takes a lot more than that. So I think we need to focus more on the, on the front end of making sure that we get to the young people before they use drugs. You know, especially with the uh, everything that's going on with uh, fentanyl, you know, the experimentation phase needs to be totally taken out of the mindset of these young folks because they need to understand that one experimentation could be a deadly consequence behind that. So I think we need to continue to, to, uh, to basically sound the alarm bell to make sure that these folks and young people in the community at large know about the dangers of drugs. Thanks, Shavala. We appreciate that. And we appreciate everyone's opening comments on that. Um, for our viewers, uh, where we're going to go next is we have some questions and discussion that we'd like to have with the panelists. And while we're doing that, we're hoping that's priming you to pose some questions to us uh, in the uh, chat feature uh, on YouTube. Uh, again, for our panelists or any one of them or all of them uh, together. Do you have any follow-up questions like from comments that you'd like to pose first? I mean, I just was jotting down what everybody said and I had some follow-up. Yeah, well, two follow-up points that actually anyone can address is definitely the, the mistrust in um, law enforcement around substance use and maybe even mental health and also ways and strategies that you can engage specifically the faith-based community. This question is really for anyone on the panel. Dr. Robinson, you want to take a stab at addressing yeah. the mistrust issue? Well, I think that is one of the biggest issues in the minority um, population that we serve because it's generational. 
um, a lot of individuals, the younger individuals today is absolutely operating off of information that has been passed down to them. One of the things we've also come to notice is even working with individuals that look like us, because we are a organization, a social service organization, there's still that level of mistrust there because it's not the people that the community has the mistrust with, it's the system. And so they feel that even though you look like us, you still a part of the system. And so that, that apprehension is still there. One of the things that we as an organization have been doing within the communities to not only increase that level of mistrust is we've been going out into the communities in our outreach efforts and meeting the individuals where they're at as opposed to constantly wanting you to come into the organization or the agency, we were going to them in their communities, in their areas, in their territories and engaging and interacting with them. On the other side of that, what we also did is as Mr. Truesdale has spoke about is we collaborated extensively with the faith-based community because especially in the African-American culture, their faith-based engagement is much stronger with their pastors than it is with individuals in the communities. And so mm -hmm. they will go to their pastor to talk about things that is going on with them, within their family, within their family member. What I found is if we have the established relationship with the pastor and the church, his recommendation to coming to the organization or even reaching out with that linkage to the organization, the um, opportunity for engagement is much more higher. So those are some of the steps that we have been taking to not only um, address that diversity component, but that equity and that inclusion piece as well. It's important to have the faith-based community um, engaging in some of this stuff, being that they were the original social workers they are the true grassroots social workers. And so collectively coming together, not only as Mr. Jackson was saying, start bridging that gap um, where individuals, where someone will make a recommendation, no, I'm not going there, that's a system. Whereas is my pastor tell me to go? And then grandma says, well, you need to go over here. We're gonna call. I'm more apt to engage. Mm -hmm. and, so Alan, and, I was, oh. Oh, go ahead, Tony, go ahead. Well, Please. I'm sorry, and and well, I was no. going to kind of riff off of what Dr. Robinson is talking about because you know the hard part is, is as being the state person in this group. Oh, I'm I'm from the government. I'm here to help. Okay, that's going to work. I mean, I, Riz Jamila, you all, you know, Javon, I, I you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, but but you know, it's hard because it, it's there. And 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 Dr. Robinson said it's system. It's not because I'm a bad person or or just oh, you look at me and oh, when he's being no. It's, it's the system. And so how do you, how do you help people kind of, um, is it build a relationship with you or build a relationship with, you know, as Dr. Robinson mentioned, with someone else and go from there. And so I think uh, the biggest thing, at least in Tennessee, you know, specifically the faith-based organizations, what we've done is work to certify our faith-based, um, you know, our, our churches and, and across the gamut. Uh, the re religion doesn't matter in terms of making sure they have the tools they are able to ask those questions. They're able to sit there and say, well, I've heard this, or my, my people who attend my church are saying this, and be able to respond in kind, and maybe you're not the one giving the answer to the individual at the church, but they are getting the answers, they are getting the connections and resources. One other thing is even as we talk about the faith-based side, but then just people in general, it's, it's how can you uh, incorporate as many peer-led um, services as possible into your work. I know right now, today, we're talking about prevention. We're talking about substance use prevention, right? Um, you know, I, in my intro, I mentioned the continuum of prevention. So it's primary prevention, you know, engaging before you start, but even on the tertiary side and the harm reduction side, it's how do we engage peers maybe who have lived experience? Because fact is, is I can do the same training education opportunity as someone who has lived experience and regardless of how effective I think I am being, it's not as good as or meaningful or, or have real world substance 
as it would from a potential peer. But then even think about lived experience in peer-led services. Well, no, it's also even the people who are familiar with, you know, as I mentioned in my intro, the perspectives, have the people who have the perspective delivering the message. There's no value in me who doesn't understand how things work in certain situations delivering a message. It will, you know, fall on deaf ears, not because they're not interested, but I don't have a connection there. I, I don't genuinely know um, the, the bridges or the gaps that need to be um, managed. And, you know, some of that is thinking about how do you or where do you meet people where they are? And uh, great to mention churches, but even then something as simple as everybody gets their haircut, right? We try to do stuff in barber shops. Um, but, but even then, hey, the youth center down the street, let's do, you know, it's a, a lot of it is finding the places where you can meet the people to deliver the messages, I, I think helps kind of bridge some of this. Sorry, Dr. Snow. No, I'll, I'll stay with Tony because you just mentioned something that Jamil and I have talked about, and then I will go back to to Dr. Smith on, on something. Tony, since you work at the state government level, we work at the federal government level. I think you just mentioned it, that oftentimes we're seen as too far removed from the actual on the ground local issue. So how could we possibly know reality? Right. Is, is, can you talk a little bit more about like that? And how how do you try to bridge that from your position? I, you know, truthfully, in terms of I'll tell you specifically what I do. It, it, this is just me in general. Is, you know, I, I wear a shirt and tie all the time. It's just tying to what I do because um, it's what I've got in the habit of doing. Uh, but the reality is, is, is my job at the state level is a to make sure we're compliant with whatever our funders expect us to do, right? But then also kind of create an outline. My job's not necessarily to fill out the outline, Rich. And so some of it is, is working with the communities, empowering the communities, and letting mm -hmm. them operate. You know, I, it's not my job to come down and say, well, Tony Jackson said this, so you should do it. No, no, no. It's, it's more of Hey, you guys, if you have a planning process, for instance, I think I may talk about the SPIF, the Strategic Prevention Framework at some point. Hey, follow your planning process. You know, if you want to, you can give it to us to look at to approve. But otherwise, go go do good work in your community. Uh, because the reality is, is, is there are times where I'm a great messenger. And there are times where I am the worst messenger. And it, I think it's taking a step back and recognizing that. And it's okay. You know, I don't have to be the solver of all. It's not possible. There's no one person that can be. And and, and the reality is, is I, I shouldn't be. It's how do we empower individuals, either by peer-led service or, one, or how do we empower communities so that it's not the state or the feds or whomever else is coming. It's the community doing the work because that's what that's how you can actually reach more people and be effective. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned an outline, I think, of guardrails. And we, mm -hmm. I, I kind of view it as, you know, even the strategic prevention framework is a set of guardrails. There's a lot of leeway yeah. in between those those guardrails, you know, and yep. as long as you stay within the guardrails, you're pretty much okay. And right. that's where we want to give people the the freedom, if you will, to be able to, yeah. you know, plan and execute the problems as they see fit at their right. local level. No, that's, that's exactly right, Rich. So, so um, Dr. Smith, I wanted to come back to the issue of uh, continue the thread about uh, faith and faith-based, because um, you and I have talked about this a lot. Um, you actually wrote a view from the field for our website, campusdrugprevention.gov, about faith and family. Um, we know those are strong protective factors. You see that specifically in the HBCUs and the work that you've done um, specifically in Louisiana, uh, which is what you wrote about? Absolutely. So we have two, um, we have four, I mentioned we have four historically black colleges and universities here Four of them are under our public umbrella, but two of them are a part of our private association, the Louisiana Association of Independent Colleges and University, Dillard University and Xavier University. Xavier University is the only HBCU historically uh, black college university that is based, uh, founded on the Catholic principles, Catholic mission, and Dillard University is explicitly founded on its Christian principles. So mm -hmm. like literally from the day students uh, begin to apply to step foot on campus, that faith part is integral into their, their campus experience. And so what we've seen is that typically students of color, particularly black students and students at HBCUs tend to utilize substances, particularly alcohol at lower rates than their white counterparts. 
And so for us, that's making sure that we do not diminish the role that faith plays. Like um, sometimes it's hard to get in with a different community if you don't look like that community, but you utilize trusted messengers that we see for the, that those communities trust. And I think the biggest example of that, because this is still all public health modeling, when the COVID vaccine came out, the communities went to trusted messengers. So those are people that are already established within a certain community that the people in that community trust. So uh, tying into the faith piece, I happen to go to one of the largest black churches in Baton Rouge where I'm at. And so when that campaign came out, vaccine clinics were set up at my church and people were able, my, my pastor was informed he met with the Department of Health. He was able to answer questions from members. And then he was also able to say, this is the information that I was given, did and ask questions again. And I think when we, when as agencies, when we set ourselves up in that way, we have to be willing to take the accountability and the questions that come with that. Because my pastor was able to go and say, these are the questions that I've gotten from Remember, This is the information they've heard. What do you have for us to give them? This is not me telling them either way, but this is me being able to present information accurate information from our Department of Health to them. Um, there's another great um, um, person of faith, Dr. Montique Sizer, who's up in our um, Monroe area, who does, who is phenomenal with Northeast um, Delta Human Services, who he utilizes his faith background also to prevent, uh, to do substitute prevention programming and um, messaging, but being able to not just diminish it, uh, ignore it, but also leverage it when it's appropriate. And then understanding also that um, when I talk about the views from the field that I wrote uh, for campus drug prevention, it's I talk about religiosity. It's a, the, the degree to which one is spiritual. It has nothing to do with a particular religion because not all people, even not all Black people share the same religion. So are you inviting local mosques or uh, local temples into your planning, your outreach efforts? Are you building in, uh, relationships with trusted messengers there? being sure of that you're literally targeting and reaching out to people that represent all uh, local community members of your particular area. And thank you for that. Great, thank you, Dr. Smith, for that. Um, we wanna shift gears a little bit. And oh, Shavala, did you wanna add to that? I was gonna transition to you as well. Did you wanna add to that? Yeah, I just quickly wanted to very quickly talk about the general distrust of law enforcement and the community. Mm -hmm especially with uh, what just recently happened in Memphis. And I'd like to say that, um, I mean, it's an, important, it's an important topic. And typically when I go out into the community, there is some of that distrust, whether it's regarding the old theories of, of you know, the CIA planting drugs into the community. And when I talk about that, especially as a, as a, as a black man, you know, I think it's pretty well received. and being that we have all heard those theories, but there's not really any specific uh, data to, to say that that ever occurred. So sometimes just being out there and listening to what the people say, uh, have to, to, to basically what they have to say with regard to whatever the, their issues might be is an important uh, component of, of dispelling some of those myths. Uh, with regard with what, to what happened in Memphis, I sort of come from two perspectives. Uh, one, being in law enforcement and, and having, uh, having folks out there in the community to understand that in all profession, any profession you're in, unfortunately, you're going to have people that are not doing the right thing. And unfortunately, that should not tarnish the badge of all law enforcement officers. We know that perhaps uh, I know historically in Memphis, there's been issues with police corruption. I mean, for a long, long time, and they, they have some sy systemic issues. However, I think most people would agree that most law abiding, uh, most law enforcement officers rather are, are upstanding, they're doing their jobs daily and they don't tarnish the badge. So I think that's an important point to make. Right, thank you, Shavalo. I'm staying with you here. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, as you engaged in the field around demand reduction and community outreach, um, have you ever personally been confronted by a hostile crowd or during any of your presentations? And if so, how did you handle the situation? Thank you for that question, Jamila. In fact, I have, and it works right into the faith-based conversation that we just, or that we're having now. I can't even remember how long it's, uh, ago it's been because I've been working demand reduction community outreach for some 25 years. And Antioch Baptist Church is a large, historically, it's, it's a large African-American church in the Atlanta area. And they have a big prevention uh, intervention 
a site where basically uh, drug addicts are, 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 are sent to a certain site to recover. And so one time I went down as a speaker and I did so by way of, I think one of the agents actually uh, was ordained through that church. And when I got in there, these were all uh, African-American males, probably about 25 of them, ranging in age from 25 to 55. And when I got in there, I could just tell by their demeanor that they were not receptive of me. They didn't want to hear anything that I had to say. And I put them in timeout. I said, time out here, guys. Time out. How many of you do not like the police? And every single one of them raised their hands. And so we went on to have a conversation about why, et cetera. And all of them had something in common. Mom and dad or brother and sister, they had vivid memories of them being dragged away by the police. And so in their minds, all policemen were, were bad. And they particularly, although I was a black guy and they were brothers as well, they, they weren't going to have it. And so as we continued to talk, I was able to break some barriers and have them understand that, you know, I wasn't there to hurt them. I was only there to help them. And at the very end of the day, they, they respected me. We hugged, they understood me. And I was able to break, break down those barriers simply because of my presence there. And so I remember that vividly because it was a, it was a great day. Thank you, Shvala. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was just envisioning, Shvala, as you were talking about that. It was, as you said before, it was the vision they had of you was the person with the badge not the person of color. And that's where their distrust came from. Again, it was the, what you wore, not who you were. Um, Tony, I'm gonna come to you um, because uh, I started my career working for a state agency, uh, just like you are, are where you are at. Um, so how does a, a state agency, you know, like yours help support local communities? We talked about a little bit like the divide and how you overcome the divide, if you will. But how do you actually support local communities, especially communities of color, in their efforts to prevent drug use? Sure. You know, s support can look like a lot of different things, right? Uh, in my position, sometimes is that you provide funding. Um, also, is it is it that you provide training? Is it that, that you give um, an avenue through which other types of support be can be given? And, and, you know, when I look at the question, I kind of go into saying, what is the basis of the work of my office, the Office of Prevention in the Division of Substance Use Services? Okay. The basis for, of our work is strategic, the Strategic Prevention Framework. You'd think I know how to say it by now. You know, <laughs> you it's just it. the public, I know, it's, you say it five <laughs> times fast, but it's just it's just a public health model. You know, it's, it's nothing that's just this, this most, most amazing thing that no one else, no, no, everyone does it to a certain extent. It's, it's a tool that has capacity, assessment, planning, implementation, and evaluation as the core components of it. I mentioned the SPIF because within those five core components, you always have to focus on two things, sustainability, right? But, but really for the essence uh, of this response is cultural humility, cultural competence, okay? So when you ask how do we support it's making sure that everything that we do is through the lens of cultural competence and cultural humility while encouraging and supporting those communities who are the ones, as I mentioned in our other response, they're the ones doing the work. It's not Tony Jackson. It's, it's the, the, the team, Jack White and his team in, in Shelby County. It's, it's Camilla and Calandra in Hamilton County in Tennessee. Um, and a lot of it is, is making sure at the state level, we, we value the cultural competence piece. But then on top of that, not that just, oh, hey, make sure it's culturally competent. That's it. You know, that, that, that's how you get something that's not, you know, we said it. Okay, we said it. So it counts, right? No, 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 no. Making sure that the sectors are involved. You know, we've got 12 key sectors. Um, you know, so we make sure, hey, make sure everyone's at the table. Um, to, to, I think, Dr. Robinson's point other earlier making sure these programs aren't just, oh, hey, everyone comes to me. I'm sitting here, I'm getting funded to do this work in the community. You come to me and I'll help you. No, making sure these are programs that do go out into the community and do work. Do that outreach piece. Sit there and always think, how are we not reaching, or no, who are we not reaching? 
and then using the spiff to figure out how they're going to reach them um, and, and being more active and less passive. So, so a lot of that, again, it goes back into making sure, you know, we said it, the outline is in place, that then the flesh and the bones and the muscle can be built onto to be as effective as possible in a respective community while continuing to provide technical assistance and support. Because the reality is, is if you work with one community provider, you work with one community provider. Um, and so you may have to, to tweak how you work with each of these as you go. So my thank you, Tony. My takeaway out of what Tony just said, um, cultural humility, cultural competence it is not a box that you check. Right. It, it right. is, is I mean, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's something that you do in every step of the process. Right. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask Allison, because she's also at a state level position, you know, with the Board of Regents in Louisiana. Do you have similar similar to what Tony was talking about? I mean, you're 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 up here kind of like. Tony was, I was in New York, uh, we are in federal government. Mm -hmm. How do you also uh, support, say, the campuses, as we've talked about, um, at the local level? So we are um, centered, headquartered at the Board of Regents, but we're actually funded through um, SAMHSA block grant funding, mainly um, through our Louisiana Department of Health, Office of Behavioral Health. And what that allows us to do is to, one, we utilize the strategic prevention framework we work all of our local regions um, and our local governing entities, which you can think of as like regional behavior health offices to see what are the individual needs of those communities. We know that there are shared needs for higher education, um, young adults in our state, but there are also very specific things that each community may need. And so often we do needs assessments with our campuses to see what do you need. For instance, um, in 2014, Louisiana passed um, a smoke-free and tobacco-free ban for all of our campuses. But actually, I believe it was 2012, one of our campuses went smoke free, tobacco free, because through our needs assessment, they had seen that as a problem on their campus two, three years earlier. So being able to respond to the individual trainings of those need, that campus needed additional training on going tobacco free. We had other institutions where they were looking to advance collegiate recovery programming. So finding out what those communities need and providing that because um, not everybody needs the same thing at the same time. And then also there's a part of capacity is, is this feasible for us to take on at this time? If I say, I'm going to give a baby a steak, the baby, if a baby's hungry, I'm going to give it a steak. The baby's still hungry, but the baby just can't handle steak. Not saying that the baby is hungry, isn't hungry. We just need to give it what it can handle at that time. There'll be time. There'll be much time for steak later. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, just a reminder for the folks who are following us today, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat. You want to go on a question? Mm -hmm. Yep. So thanks again, Dr. Smith. So following up on the conversation around the SPIF, uh, cultural competency, cultural um, Humility again. The SPIF is just a a planning model, a model that we use to encourage communities to think from assessment and data and follow each step and process as they begin to look at strategies to address their substance misuse um, problem. This question is for Dr. Robinson. Can you talk a little bit about how factors are prominent in African Americans um, regarding substance related accidental overdoses and how can those factors um, be addressed specifically using the SPIF well, strategic framework model? Thank you. I think that's one thing that's really, really significant. Um, be, be, fentanyl has played a major factor in our overdose rate here, fentanyl and carfentanyl. However, within the African-American community, those numbers are still significantly higher. And I believe a lot of that has to do with the fact that in those communities, there's still a high level of cocaine and marijuana use, mm -hmm. other substances that are now also being laced. And mm -hmm. so taking the focus not only on just one particular substance, and looking at it across the board um, could increase the access of service delivery. So in utilizing the SPIF model, not only in that assessment planning, and one thing that I wanted to say, a big component of inclusion is being able to have a voice. So if I'm going into those communities 
and looking at those communities, not only on a surface level, but looking at the iceberg and starting to look up under the water and seeing mm -hmm. some of those other health disparities and things that are impacting those individuals. Here in Dayton, Ohio, over the past four years, we have had a significant amount of negative impact environmentally that has happened in this area that has affected all um, mm -hmm. individuals in these communities, mentally, physically, and emotionally. First, we had the mass shooting. Then right after the mass shooting, we had the major tornado. Then right after the major tornado, we had COVID. And so mm -hmm. a lot of individuals, not only mentally and emotionally, have gone through some changes and substances has been their relief. Getting that information out to them has been difficult, again, because of the disconnect. So looking at those different communities in our assessment part of the SPIF model and going a little deeper as to understanding with the minority population, there is still a high level of marijuana and cocaine and methamphetamine use, you know, um, as opposed to just saying opioids is the problem. And then this is what we're going to address because then we're still missing the mark. That so, also plays into the fact where it rolls into building that capacity and then even in the planning process of how can we best serve those individuals. And it goes back to what I originally spoke about in the introduction is being able to have the messaging that is relatable and understanding to the different cultures and the diversity of the people that we are reaching out to. Thank you, Tony. You, we saw Tony wanted to come on in there. Yeah, no, I just, you know, as she talks about, you know, basically different communities and, and we have this nationwide issue. It's a nationwide issue. I know, you know, I know the DEA is on the front lines of this in terms of, hey, how do we keep fentanyl from getting into the United States? In the state of Tennessee, almost three fourths of all of our fatal overdoses were due to fentanyl or fentanyl and, uh, you know, cause or linked to that. But then even when you look at the overdose data and, and within the African American population, you are seeing a greater increase in overdose rates um, and fatal overdose rates than in other populations. And, and so, you know, it's one of those things where as you look at it, one of the, the it's a little anecdotal, but, but I think it's a good mention here today, is we're working with the community trying to figure out what's going on. A comment was made, oh, hey, I don't go to my SSP, which is syringe services provider, that's what we call them in Tennessee. I don't go to my SSP because I don't inject drugs. Well, you know why, why that, that's a problem? If you went to an SSP, you don't have to inject drugs to go to an SSP, but an SSP is a great mechanism by which we here in Tennessee and other states as well can connect with people who use drugs, provide resources, materials, um, provide feedback, insight, and or naloxone kits, overdose response kits, right? So we, we may miss out on a whole population just because they say, well, I don't inject, so I don't need to go there. It's people who inject that need to go there. But to Dr. Robinson's point in, in all the data, fentanyl is in not everything, but almost everything, be it, be it the things that individuals inject and not. And so when we think about these risk factors, it's what messaging do we need to do? Is it that we need to change the name of SSPs? I'm not necessarily proposing that. But, but maybe we need to say, oh, well, this is what they actually do. And it's making sure you make those connections that, that, that maybe knock down some of the negative connotations or, or perceived negative connotations with, with wording or phraseology while recognizing, oh, wow, hey, it might be more of an outreach thing than, again, someone coming to you, right? It's how do I help them understand or how do I help you understand as a person rather than, oh, I'll just sit here and wait back because we've got all these syringe services providers and they do a great job of this and that's how we're gonna reach um, people who use drugs. Uh, I think it's, again, doing that assessment capacity and all that to identify, hey, maybe we need to activate other mechanisms. Thank you, Tony. I, I was a bit of an offshoot from what Dr. Robinson mentioned. So, so Shavala, I'm gonna to come to you. Um, with this and it's it's a it's something that we at the 
federal government in particular have been criticized about. And Tony, you may chime in after Shivalo speaks because you may get this also at the state government level. But Dr. Robinson talked about, you know, fentanyl obviously is top of mind mm -hmm. across all communities. Fentanyl is not a discriminating drug right now. We know that it's affecting everybody. But we also know that there are other drugs out there that are the drug of concern for the community, whether it's marijuana, whether it's heroin, it could be meth, it could be cocaine. Um, and on the issue around cocaine, so Shivalo, I was going to ask you, because I know you've been in the field for a while, as I have, as Jamil has, as everybody on this call has to some degree. You know, we have at the federal government really an all hands on deck approach to the opioid crisis. We have had for like the last 15 years or so. And I could go the litany of alphabet soup of the agencies. So you've got SAMHSA, DEA, FDA, NIDA. Uh, I mean, it's CDC. I mean, we have this all hands on deck approach. Um, and we often get criticized about why didn't the government have this full court press to the cocaine epidemic in the 1980s? And I'd even go so far as to say the heroin epidemic of the 1990s, when so many in the black community were dying from overdoses or were being sent to prison. So, as someone who works for the government <clears throat> and works in the prevention, community outreach field, how do you help respond to that and not dismiss it, but acknowledge the comment, um, but try to explain it? Thank you for the question, Rich. <clears throat> Certainly there were some inequities when we talked about the crack epidemic, with, especially with regard to the, the sentencing guidelines. Why? Because it only took five grams of cocaine base or crack cocaine to get a to get a minimum mandatory sentence of five years. Mm -hmm. Whereas with cocaine or powder cocaine hydrochloride, it only took, uh, it took, uh, I'm sorry, 50 grams. So there, was de there were definitely some inequities there. And at the time, the majority of the crack cocaine dealers were African-Americans, right? And so it started, um, that was sort of the beginning of mass incarceration, as we know, with a lot of African-Americans. And so, uh, there were, there were definitely some inequities there. And I think um, if you compare that to, compare and contrast to what's going on with the opioid epidemic, you know, I, I think it's a notion of, uh, to me, in my mind, uh, there should be no differentiation between a doctor who is selling pills out of the back door. Um, I think they're hiding behind the guise of a stethoscope in a, in a white coat. Um, they're no different than a crack dealer on a corner. Um, they should be held liable in, in, in their complicitness to sell, to sell poison. So <clears throat> another thing you have to look at as well is that, is that uh, the mass incarceration from blacks back in, the, back in the day when the crack cocaine epidem epidemic was going on, you know, the argument was why were, you know, uh, it was, again, it was not equitable, right? You had folks that were going to jail and in prison and when you look at the, the opioid epidemic, it seems that the, the money, we're talking about resources and money, the resources and money um, to that epidemic, it was going to treatment and prevention and education. I mean, why spend all the money they were spending and, and, and send the programs to, I mean, the programs were sending funds to incarceration and, and policing. So <clears throat> one thing I do is I pivot and talk about the fact that there were inequities, but you know, there's, there's, you have to uh, understand that, uh, again, the difference is, um, you know, I, I don't personally uh, agree that, that there's, that, you know, uh, why, you know, people were, were ringing the bell, et cetera, you know, so I just have to kind of pivot and say, we're not legislators. Our job is to make sure that we're enforcing the Title 21 drug laws of the Constitution. That is our job. Unfortunately, when it comes to legislation and laws, that's above my pay grade. So I have them understand where I'm coming from, from a law enforcement uh, agent, that my job is supply reduction, going through the criminals, and, I'm, and it's led to the legislators to decide. Now, again, I never agreed with the, with the, uh, the crack cocaine and, and the, the amount because my feelings were, okay, if it takes a byproduct, which was is cocaine, to make crack cocaine, it seems that they would be about the same, but I understand at the time, the hot point was violence because when you smoke crack, you know, it, it, it leads to more violent offenses, et cetera. So that's pretty much my answer, Rich. 
So I think, Allison, did I see your hand go up? Yeah, go ahead, Allison. Yeah. So um, one, you probably could get me on a soapbox all day about the war on drugs and the, the sentencing disparities. But part of that, I think one comes back to our messaging piece. Who gets seen as victims? Who gets seen as those who, who receive sympathy? So for one, mm -hmm. I think part of a really big key piece with the opioid epidemic, and I think one of the things that negatively impacts uh, Black communities for its opioid use, because uh, Anthony pointed out a really great point. When you break down the statistics, you aggregate it by race, Opioid overdoses are statistically rising faster in Black communities. But typically, what we're presented as the poster kid for opioid uh, misuse is middle aged white people. And so, Black people do not tend to see themselves in the market or see themselves at risk for that type of opioid overdose or misuse because they don't see themselves represented in the messaging and the things that we put out. So part of that's so a one, if I'm not seeing myself, it doesn't look like it applies to me and I feel mm -hmm. like I'm less at risk. So I'm more likely to present to participate in more risky behaviors. And I think something specific to the college world, uh, Rich, we talk about it all the time that the inverse order of drug use is look after alcohol and marijuana, it becomes stimulants, um, Opioids, uh, et cetera, it is opioids, et cetera, it is stimulants. But for college students, that flips. That becomes stimulants tend to be students, college students' drug of choice. And so for us and what we've seen, the uh, the spread of fentanyl to fake pills. So we've seen students die over taking what they thought was Xanax, what they thought was Adderall. Um, with Vivant. So there's an Adderall, national Adderall shortage. So you have a young person in your life, a college student that tell you they got, they got a whole bunch of Adderall. It's probably not real Adderall. So one, being sure that we tell them the risk that they're at by showing them reflective marketing materials and messaging that reflect the risk that, they, that they're at. And then also on the flip side, if we look at recovery, we have to be able to see people of color in recovery. So one person who is probably really, really big in the African-American community, and most people may not even know that he's in recovery. Charlie Wilson is one of the biggest, like, like, like old school Spanish generation from the Gap Band mm -hmm. from the 70s and stuff to still making music now. He's a person in long-term recovery over 30 years. There are not pe many people who know that are when we choose to highlight stories of recovery, what celebrities, what influencers do we go after to speak to different communities? Being sure that we're able to show people, to show um, students, young uh, adults, people in different communities, what that looks like and that they too can be successful in recovery. Right, thank you, um, Allison. I appreciate that perspective. Messaging is important, um, seeing yourself in messaging um, and when we're doing community Outreach is extremely um, important. I'm going to pivot to a question that we received in the chat mm -hmm. um, to kind of get us to begin to address some of our questions. So one of the first questions is, how do you best go about serving communities where there has not been a needs assessment done or data surrounding substance use available? Tony or Dr. Robinson, you want to take a stab at that question? I mean, I, you know, I'll, I'll maybe start. I think Dr. Smith also took herself off mute on that one. Yeah, I, it's hard. Um, you know, we want data to guide our work, right? We, we, I know my department, we, we preach it and live it. We are data driven in, in almost every decision we make. But there are also realities around data. And is it that you need to do an assessment? Is it that you need to find data from a some, film? similar community and do a comparison of sorts? Is it that you need to work to build to being able to do that assessment? Because you may not be able to do that with the involvement uh, of, of the community members who will give you a real assessment, not a, I think this is what's going on, so this is what we should do assessment. Uh, I, I think it's being willing to, to take the time to, to do that, but at the same time recognize that there are things you may be able to do without a full assessment. The reality is, is much of the work that we do in, in the Office of Prevention and by way of our, our block grant or other discretionary funding, it's universal type work, right? It's not for, oh, only just one person supposed to get this because they're the one I want to target. And so, so that may be something to where uh, we mentioned earlier, sector involvement, um, subsets of subsets of groups and making sure people are at the table and able to have their, their opinions and perspectives heard, not that they can just state their opinions and perspectives, but actually be heard and then go from there. 
I think a fear and concern I always have is, is we may freeze due to lack of data. Uh, whereas th there are things that you can do even as a soft, hey, we, we could do this and then build towards being able to do a full needs assessment. That may not be what everybody loves to hear, but it's something to where, um, again, I, I don't want us to be frozen and just choose not to do anything. Oh, we can't do anything because, right? Anyways, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Dr. Robinson, did you have anything to add to that? Yes, I did. And um, one of the things, um, when you're talking about community, there may not be an extensive amount of assessments for a particular community, but there is most likely uh, some limited uh, information or data mm -hmm. pertaining to that community. Yeah. One of the things that we do here in Montgomery County, if there is limited information, we tap into our community needs assessments, as well as look at our archival data and uh, communities that are similar in nature as uh, Mr. Jackson was saying, and do a comparison. But one of the things we also do is we go into that community and do focus groups and start collecting data. Hmm. That is really, really important because again, as I was saying earlier, letting the individuals have a voice, it's not so much of we going into the community saying, this is what's wrong with you, we're here to fix you, as opposed to how can we serve you? What are your needs? Because for example, if a mother comes to me with six children that lives in a four bedroom house that is about to get evicted, um, I'm not going to put the bandaid over it and pay her rent and her late fees and send her on her way. That's just a bandaid solution. We're going to look a little bit deeper and find out what's going on that you're not. It might be the fact that the job that you have only paying $12 an hour but the size house that you have to have for the size family that you have makes it very difficult for you to sustain. And a lot of times you're taking from Peter to pay Paul. So how can we help you move to another level, whether it's higher education, helping you become more marketable, giving you some skills and some things to elevate yourself. It goes back to that old saying, you teach a person to fish, they eat for a lifetime, but if you give them a fish, they only eat for the moment. That's that concept. But going into those communities, doing focus groups, um, doing uh, surveys, we call them environmental scans down here in this area, doing surveys and collecting that information. It's not um, an extensive level of data, but it's more information to add to what limited data that you have to bet to help better serve the community that you're you're dealing with. Right, thank you, Dr. Robinson. And I was just gonna to pivot to, to Dr. Smith because I know that we've been on, you know, in sessions together of late and you've brought up this issue around data and the availability of data and how to use it. Do you wanna speak a little bit about that uh, from your perspective? Yes, I think part of it is one, so I have I have, an, I have a couple soapboxes. So here, another one is um, evidence-based <laughs> programs. Um, so according to SAMHSA's latest reporting in 2022, that it takes 17 years for a program to be considered evidence-based or evidence-informed. My community doesn't have 17 years to wait till we decide something works enough for us to call it evidence-based. So once, I think Anthony made a really good point, starting with what you have. Dr. Robinson made another good point. So one, we, are we, we see where we're lacking information. There's nothing stopping us from hosting a community event with some food, some resources, and doing a focus group there, allowing people to tell us that concern. That counts as a needs assessment, going to people, meeting them where they are, not telling them to pop into your office, come down to where having them at times that make sense for your community. Um, if you are in a heavily Jewish community, I wouldn't recommend having something late in the evening on a Friday night, being cognizant of where you are and the people you're trying to serve. Um, Again, making sure that it's accessible for everybody. One, um, at this point, I don't think we're ever going to get away from Zoom. So if it's, is it that you need to record your meetings and provide them for parents who can't work, for community members can't work? Is there some way, some kind of way you can have virtual coffee chats, being able to make sure your information is, a, is as accessible to as many people as possible? Thank you. And another question? Yeah, another we'll question. probably have time for one more before we have to start to wrap up. Okay. And this is the last question that I have. Are there minority serving organizations that you can recommend by local group can reach out to to include in their local prevention efforts? 
So are there any specific minority serving organizations that come to mind other coalitions or providers could reach out to if they're trying to reach this population? So one, I can jump in here. I know we're short on time. I would definitely say reach out. There's a local branch of the NAACP. Start there. They would have a list or an urban league. They will have more than likely a list of all of the other minority serving um, community organizations. Reach out to your local mayor's, your mayor's office. They may also have a list there or your state government agency that there's usually some type of minority serving business organization structure they have. Reaching out to those reaching out to any HBCUs that you may have, or if you have mainly predominantly white or historically white institutions, seeing if there's some type of affinity group or uh, uh, caucus for students and staff of a a particularly minority population. Um, Doing all of those are really uh, key things and being sure that, oh, this is one of my, this is a freebie, Uh, reaching out to your local urban radio station that typically for a uh, nonprofit organization, they will allow you to come on there for free to advertise. And they typically have a rotation of people with similar shared interests for broader community health, reaching out to them um, in Baton Rouge. Everybody knows who cool DJ Super Mike is and all the community programs and things they're having big community wide prevention events. They go on the radio, they go on there for free. They talk to them, they get their messaging out. And then he, he or Latangela Faye can connect them with other organizations, but reaching out to whatever the biggest urban radio station is in your local market will be a really great place to start as well. Right. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dr. Robinson. Robinson. Mm-hmm. Yes. And one um, um one of the um national organizations also that I didn't hear Dr. Smith mention was the um Black Caucus, reaching out to them. But then if you're referencing, if you're from Ohio. The Umadops of Dayton, which is the Urban Minority Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Outreach Program. So we have a federation, we are statewide. There's 11 Umadops across the state of Ohio um, that you can be able to connect, partner with, and engage in services addressing minorities because we serve all populations, but we have a primary focus on the African-American, Hispanic, and underserved communities. Right. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. So as we wrap up, we want each of our panelists to take a minute and offer up a hopeful takeaway or call to action for our audience, as well as identify a go-to resource to help guide you in your prevention efforts. So Dr. Robinson, we'll start with you. It is like on this platform where we encourage innovative change. Um, That has been the bottom line and the base foundation, the diversity, equity, inclusion. And although change seems hard, it is doable. And so my call and my challenge, my call to action and challenge to you, as well as an encouragement, is to tap into your communities, your villages, be a change agent, be a change maker, speak up, talk to your legislation, um, do some things to help bring inclusiveness so that all can heal in your community, not just some. Great, thank you, Dr. Robinson. Dr. Smith? Um, one, and this, I will particularly say this for my uh, our viewers that are not people of color. I'm not asking you to become experts in people of color. That is not what we're going for. Not asking you to come in to save anybody, not come in to ask you to rescue anybody. What I'm asking you to do is to step outside of your comfort zone, set up quick meetings with people of color, organizations, departments of color, and say, hey, my office has some resources. I'd like to, I'd be interested in finding out what do you do and what are ways we can work together? Not asking to save you. I am asking for ways that we can better partner together. Most people won't turn down and offer the partnership, but you got to be honest about one, you're not coming to save anybody because no one needs you to save them. But two, also, we all are committed to the same shared health of all of our constituency, our students, and our communities. Just finding ways to better work together so that all of our voices are heard, all of our uh, input is included, and that we all have a seat at the table. Great. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Tony? Sure. You know, I, I think kind of, you know, the call to action is hard, right? Because this is a group of people who have access to different types of resources from wherever they are. And so, so when you take it to a high level and you think about what could a call to action be, you know, take kind of some nuggets from this discussion today. It's been great to be here with uh, Javalo, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Smith, and, and even you, you, Rich, and Jamila, as we've been able to have this conversation, 
right? Have these types of conversations. I like the idea of getting out of your comfort zone. Recognize that people have shared values. You have a common thread somewhere. Use that as an opportunity to maybe engage someone who you maybe wouldn't usually engage, but then also recognize we might have, you know, not that different values are bad, but different values, different perspectives, and understand that and be okay if they're not the same as yours. Recognize that, that you may be uh, an expert in your field and know everything there is to know about what, what, what you know. Recognize that other individuals are in the same position, right? Their perspectives, the lens and the prism that they look at things can actually help enlighten you. Uh, and, 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 you know, last thing I'll say is recognize that when you do your work, you have got to, not even work, but outreach and everything like that, be deliberate. We're not here just to just check a box, right? Be deliberate, be, be honest with yourself. Um, and, and, you know, if you're there to just check a box and that's the way you feel, recognize that. But at the same time, try not to have that perspective. I feel like those type of earnest conversations um, enrich all of us in, in an effort to, to help us, you know, work collaboratively to solve the problems in our respective communities. Thank you, Tony. And Shavala? Yes, so my, my takeaway is, is everyone should take this issue personally. We all know that drugs don't discriminate. You know, I know we have talked about you know race today but this thing encompasses this issue encompasses all races you know when it comes to cultural humility it focuses on self humility so we need to focus on ourselves and 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 know that we're doing everything that we can do to make sure that we can turn the tide on this issue that we have you know we we all have a vested interest in in making sure that we reduce the demand for drugs in this country and so i think if we get if we take it personally, I think we all know someone that's that's died from a drug overdose. If not, you know someone that knows someone. So I think the charge would be to take it, take it personally. Uh, we seem to care more about things that we are passionate about. And I think if we take it personally and, 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 and we're all fully invested, then we shall make a difference in the end. Great. Thank you, Shavalo. And with that, we want to thank each of our panelists for joining us today for this important dialogue. To our viewers, we hope you found this discussion helpful in your prevention efforts. And in the spirit of takeaways, I just made some quick notes. First of all, Tony, I'm going to jump off of what you said about be deliberate. So Dr. Smith, you know, I'm going to jump in here. I have the catchphrase with all the work that we do in prevention, no matter which populations you're working with, which strategy you're going to, to devise be strategic, be intentional, and be purposeful. It's not a random thing. Um, the other takeaway is it's not a checkbox, um, right? It's interwoven throughout all parts of your planning. Um, one of the things Jamil had asked about is uh, what is a go-to resource? And so for our viewers, I would suggest you use the archived version of this panel discussion as a resource and share it with others in your communities, in your workplaces, in your schools, um, because it can serve as a resource. The four panelists can serve as a resource. And certainly we can put you in touch with any or all of them. Um, if you want to connect with them, uh, some of them are really popular and, and out there on social. Um, other ways we can connect you by email uh, and, and make those connections for you. But before we go, we do want to take a moment to let you know that the next National Prescription Drug Take Back Day is scheduled for Saturday, April 22nd. That's 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. local time. And you can visit www.deatakeback.com for more details. And with that, we want to thank again our four panelists, and we want to thank you, our viewers, for, for tuning in, and we ask that you all have a great day. Thank you. Great. Thank you.